Hazardous weather graphic here showing winter weather advisories out with the area of snow moving across uh, the central interior tonight, ending from west to east, actually here for uh, Galena down in the northern coast, Coombe Valley, ending this evening, but continuing uh, into tomorrow here for the Fairbanks area, Yukon Flats, on up into the Yukon, or up into the Eastern Brooks Range. And then there's a blizzard warning out tonight through tomorrow for the Eastern Arctic Coast for whiteout conditions with uh, winds, uh, gusty winds and blowing snow. And then less of that, uh, visibility is about a half mile at times or less here for the East Central Arctic Coast. And that's uh, for tonight through tomorrow. And from for looking at the satellite imagery, here's the area clouds coming in that's bringing the areas of snow uh, from uh, about the central interior here up to the Arctic coast. But south and east of the Alaska range, clear skies, actually even down into uh, Bristol Bay today, some sunshine. Sunshine Kodiak Island and on up into the Copper River Basin. And some clearing earlier on here up over the uh, eastern interior, but clouds moving in this afternoon there. And quite a bit of clearing occurring here over the southeast coast. Coast. And really no big storms on the chart here. We've got a weak system here bringing some light precipitation up to the eastern Aleutians. Otherwise, uh, just some uh, kind of disorganized clouds out over the western Bering Sea there with uh, kind of southwest flow as high pressure builds over the central Aleutians up through the central Bering Sea and into the Bering Strait that'll be shifting eastward, almost dropped my map advancer, be shifting eastward in, uh, for the uh, night tonight and tomorrow and into the uh, Friday. Otherwise, on the chart here today, we have a cold front there over the eastern Arctic coast. Pretty weak though as it uh, extends down just some areas of flurries here possibly uh, into the southern Cuscombe Valley, maybe mixed with freezing rain or some light rain, but pretty light precipitation in this area. And then that kind of links up with this warm front moisture here, but that's pretty light also with uh, rain in the eastern Aleutians there, maybe clipping the Alaska Peninsula. You can see a lot of high pressure on the map here. Uh, uh, the one main one here building over the northern Bering Sea but extends all the way down to the western Aleutians. Light winds through this area today. In fact, light winds all across the state today into the Gulf of Alaska, Kodiak Island. And the northern pan had a little breezy with those northeast winds there, but nothing strong, too terribly strong. <clears throat> and then we'll see for tonight, the system tracks eastward and we get uh, clearing from west to east coming in and uh, shouldn't get any precipitation south of the Alaska range, but into the Copper River Basin, a weak trough there. And this weak low in the Gulf of Alaska could kick off some light snow showers to the eastern North Gulf Coast. And uh, into the Copper River Basin, could be some areas of light snow tonight. More so, though, north of the Alaska Range. Could be a few inches here over the central and eastern interior areas. And tightening gradient there starts to pick the winds up there along the Arctic coast and eastern Brooks Range. And winds uh, not too bad over the Panhandle. Maybe some few clouds in the north, but mostly clear down to the south. Otherwise, uh, we still have this weak disturbance out here south of the main high center. Just a uh, chance of rain from Nikolsky into uh, Atka and probably skirting Adak. And that's it, no big storms out west here at all, just really high pressure over the Bering Sea building and see the pressure of the two centers now up over 1,040 millibars. And moving on to tomorrow, conditions improve there for the eastern Arctic coast in the afternoon uh, with uh, diminishing winds, light winds over the central Arctic coast and the north slope under the high pressure center back down into the northern Bering Sea looking at very light winds with a lot of clear skies here, St. Lawrence Island into the Seward Peninsula, Norton Sound, all of the interior here slowly spreading eastward. This area light snow slowly ending from west to east here 
continuing throughout the day with probably some IFR over the eastern interior into the afternoon on down toward the eastern Alaska range, Mentasta Pass, for example, and some snow shower chances continuing mainly around the Yakutat area and along the north coast of the Panhandle, just a risk of a light snow shower, otherwise variable clouds, light winds, and partly to mostly sunny skies with the southern southeast coast. And winds starting to increase here. Might see a pickup in the winds tomorrow afternoon for the uh, Manuska Valley out of the northeast and then tomorrow night and Friday. Look for uh, northeast winds possibly gusting to 55 miles an hour for the Manuska Valley and uh, 50 to 60 mile an hour wind gusts possible for Valdez out of the northeast. That same pattern here with this tightening gradient now over the northern pan. Then look for stronger winds out of the north and northeast there, especially Lynn Canal, uh, Eldred Rock. Otherwise, high pressure, sunny skies, temperatures a little colder. Um, but not uh, too terribly cold, getting in toward mid-March now, but it will be definitely cooler, especially the higher elevation areas will see significant cooling from what you've seen the last couple, three days. Otherwise, just a weak trough coming in Friday on the western Arctic coast with some flurries with that and lower flying conditions. Looking really good out here over the Bering Sea. Again, light offshore flow keeping uh, VFR and clear skies right to Nunavak Island and well off the southwest coast in across Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula. The only thing out here, a couple of weak troughs uh, could kick off a few showers over the Aleutians, and that's about it. This is so washed out, it's not even worth talking about. So moving on to uh, temperatures for tonight, mid-teens for the uh, Susitna Valley and the Copper River Basin, with lower to mid-teens in the Kuskokoon Valley, 20 to 25 for your lows there in Bristol Bay, lower 30s, Kodiak Island, and uh, just above zero here for Yakutat and the Northern Panhandle, otherwise 15 to 25 for the southern southeast coast and then highs tomorrow northern areas here in the 20s and 30s down to the south and lower 40s Valdez could hit 42 tomorrow Seward maybe 40 same thing for Homer otherwise right near the freeze point there for Gulcan and the Copper River Basin some areas a little colder some areas a little warmer in the 30s here south central Alaska 35 to 40 about sums it up all the way to from Homer from uh, Talkeetna there and lower 40s Kodiak Island and in the 30s for Bristol Bay upper 20s northern coast Kuskokoon Valley to mid 30s to the south. Lows falling a little below zero there for McGrath and Nikolai on the morning for Friday. Otherwise, uh, mid teens for Bristol Bay down to about uh, 30 degrees for Kodiak. And uh, South Central Alaska, a little cooler now into the mid teens there. Well, about the same in the teens for uh, much er many areas of South Central Alaska until you get down toward Homer, a little about 24 there. And zero to 10 for the Copper River Basin. Mid teens for the northern pan, and a little milder here with that increasing wind, and uh, mid 20s to the south, followed by highs 25 to 30 northern southeast coast, lower 30s for Yakutat, 35 to 40 down toward uh, Ketchikan, Metlakatla area, lower 20s up to the Copper River Basin, and we've got uh, lower to mid 30s here for south central Alaska now, some cooler air coming in near 40 still for Kodiak in the lower 30s for Bristol Bay and in the 20s for the Cuscombe Valley. Up to the north, uh, you can see the zero degree isotherm here just west of Arctic Village down to uh, west of Bettles and then right out across the Alaska or the uh, Seward Peninsula here down to St. Lawrence Island. So a little below zero there to the northwest and in the teens to the southwest of that line. And then the highs tomorrow in the uh, mid to upper 20s here over the eastern part of the state and a little below zero on the central Arctic coast. Otherwise, to 15 elsewhere and then the lows for Friday morning looking uh, a little colder with the colder air coming in below zero now just about across the whole area zero to five here for the Seward Peninsula out towards St. Lawrence Island into the uh, northern Yukon Delta and 15 to 25 below for the North Slope and the Arctic Coast coldest here on the east side and it'll be followed by highs in the teens for the Tanana Valley now and 5 to 15 up uh, into the northern valleys and uh, single numbers a little below zero on the eastern Arctic coast into the mid-teens back here to the west. Mid-teens for the Seward Peninsula 16 there at Nome and 20 for Savunga. Mid 20s for the Cody or for the <laughs> St. Paul area tonight. Lower teens here along the southwest coast. Lower 30s for the Central Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula, followed by highs 40 to 45 there from Cold Bay to Alaska. Lower 40s for Adak and Atka and Shimya, near 32 for St. Paul, followed by lows in the mid 20s there for the Pribilofs. 
mid-30s for the Aleutians, 20s for the Alaska Peninsula, followed by highs. 35 to 42 for the Alaska Peninsula, some areas of the Aleutians into the lower 40s, and then a little cooler along the southwest coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Starting the day off uh, on Thursday with some IFR here from the Aleutians across the southeast Bering Sea, especially into Bristol Bay and up through the Cuscoom Valley, and then over to the eastern interior from uh, almost the North Gulf Coast all the way up to the eastern Arctic coast, improving back to the west in marginal VFR for the western Aleutians out here, Panhandle VFR to start the day with. And it looks like some uh, possible marginal VFR slipping in, mainly along the coast here, possibly over toward the border, otherwise uh, staying pretty good. Good VFR here across southern Alaska, improving from west to east throughout the day, but uh, IFR lingering over here, over the uh, eastern Alaska range, north, northern slopes of the eastern Alaska range, and also up there, Eagle, northward a little bit. But good VFR out into the northern Bering Sea. Out over the southern Bering Sea, you got some areas of uh, IFR with that extend down to Adak and Atka, south side of uh, the Fox Islands there, and another batch out there toward Chimney and Attu. Then for the Friday morning time frame, good VFR here, Eastern Bering Sea, interior Alaska, possible marginal VFR in areas here, north uh, the Alaska Range, upper Tanau Valley, 40 mile country to Eagle, and then on up to the north there, but staying south of the Burks Range. North Slope Arctic Coast looking good, as well as the Gulf of Alaska, Kodiak Island, the Alaska Peninsula, band of IFR out here over the Southern Bering Sea and the Central Aleutians, another one poised to move in to uh, the far western Aleutians, southeast coast, good VFR, possibly some marginal VFR around Prince of Wales Island. And for Friday afternoon, nothing but VFR here over the uh, Gulf of Alaska panhandle. All of interior Alaska, maybe some low stuff around the eastern Alaska range, possibly Kodiak Island VFR, Alaska Peninsula, Eastern Bering Sea, right up to the Seward Peninsula. And it looks like a band of, of marginal VFR here dropping into the western Arctic coast on down across uh, the Noatak Valley in the northwest coast. And out to the west, uh, some areas of uh, IFR here over the uh, West Central Aleutians and between the Commodorskis and Attu Island and passes for tomorrow. IFR becoming VFR for Anatuvik. Lowest conditions for Attigan will be early on in the day, improving throughout into the afternoon. And Lake Clark and Merrill, good VFR flying either approach tomorrow and wet, rainy uh, VFR. Marginal VFR to start becoming VFR at some point in the day, it's probably by afternoon tomorrow. And Isabel improving, but uh, only improving the marginal VFR. Could go VFR late in the afternoon. And Mentasta, hold on to the IFR mostly throughout the day, although kind of improving in the late afternoon. Got to wait till tomorrow evening probably. And for Tanita, VFR. Portage, VFR. Chilkoot and White, both VFR. Freezing levels, uh, not quite as far up to the Arctic coast as they had been, kind of getting knocked down with that upper level disturbance pulling colder air in from the west. So we got 2,000 feet tomorrow morning, still over uh, Kenai Peninsula up into the Copper River Basin, 4,000 feet there down around uh, Kamishak Bay, and 6,000 feet over Kodiak Island. Otherwise, taking a look at icing, not a whole lot to talk about. This area here shifting eastward, um, areas of uh, isolated moderate rime icing uh, below 9,000 feet here over the eastern interior. Again, ending from west to east throughout the day, staying north of the panhandle. And then with that uh, warm front moisture out here, uh, the uh, loose central Aleutians could see the uh, threat of possible light rime icing out there below 12,000 feet. Looking at the jet stream, we've got uh, upper level low out here south of the western Aleutians. So flow coming up, taking a turn to the east, 75 to 85 knots, picking up out of the northwest to 95 knots there across the Kenai Peninsula. And the strongest winds stay west of the panhandle, this elevation, and high pressure here at 9,000 feet. So good northerly wind. 35 to 45 knots there from the Arctic coast all the way down into the Gulf of Alaska and the Northeast Pacific. 
And for the uh, <clears throat> 3,000 foot wind flow chart showing southeast breezes here over the eastern Aleutians and high pressure northern Bering Sea into the north slope. Northerly winds maybe up to 45 knots over the Kenai Peninsula, but pretty light elsewhere, kind of uh, brisk there in the eastern Arctic coast. Turbulence wise, light to, isolate, light to isolated moderate turbulence here, uh, south central Alaska, all the way down to Kodiak Island, maybe moderate turbulence around Kamishak Bay, Homer Seldovia, Port Moeller. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the Pacific coast of Japan generated a tsunami. This series of ocean waves sped towards the island nation with waves reaching 24 feet high. The result was devastation and utter destruction. Towns were engulfed by water and swept away. Farmland was flooded. Tens of thousands of lives were lost. The National Police Agency reported damages to hundreds of roads, bridges, and more than 100,000 buildings. The surging water flooded rivers and destroyed harbors. In some areas along the coast, tsunami waves reached six miles inland. Tsunamis not only cause severe damage when they first strike land, but also as the water recedes back to sea. Tsunamis can inflict this type of damage because of some unique features. As tsunami waves travel across ocean basins, they may be as little as a few centimeters high, but they extend down to the ocean floor. This is different than traditional waves, which are only surface features. Tsunamis can also travel hundreds of miles per hour in the open ocean. As these waves approach a coast, the shallowing ocean floor slows the waves down and pushes the water mass upwards. The quicker the ocean floor transitions from deep to shallow, the greater potential for a higher wave height. So, tsunamis that experience this sudden shift into shallow water can have the height and momentum to pack a serious punch. Unfortunately, Japan found itself in this scenario. This image shows how abruptly the Japanese islands rise out of the ocean. Other coastal areas in the region have much more gradual slopes. The earthquake on March 11th was the most powerful known to hit Japan, and the tsunami it created had the necessary ingredients to make it such a deadly and destructive force. east of Japan, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake rocks the ocean floor. This disturbance causes a transfer of energy from the seafloor to the ocean, generating a series of ocean waves known as a tsunami. In about 20 minutes, waves strike the Japanese coastline. Other nations go on high alert because the tsunami will propagate or spread throughout the Pacific Ocean. As the tsunami radiates outward from Japan, it encounters a variety of ocean features, such as ridges and underwater volcanoes, which guide the tsunami and create a complex pattern of scattering and reflective waves. In eight hours, the waves reached the Hawaiian Islands, and in nine and a half hours, they hit the west coast of the United States. In 16 hours, the tsunami reaches the Indian Ocean and New Zealand, and by 22 hours, the entire Pacific Ocean had been affected. The impact of a tsunami can be highly variable because of the complicated interactions with ocean features and coastline elements. Wave height and speed will differ from place to place. Since tsunamis can be hundreds of miles long and travel thousands of miles away from where they originated, they are considered a worldwide threat when they form. These are the sounds of a tsunami warning. 
they alert residents that a killer wave is about to strike. These sirens, however, are just a small part of the sophisticated warning systems that played a role in Japan and in the U.S. during the Pacific Ocean tsunami in March 2011. Most tsunamis are generated by an undersea earthquake. Fortunately, Japan has one of the most advanced earthquake early warning systems in the world. It detects tremors, calculates the epicenter, and sends out warnings from over a thousand seismographs scattered throughout the country. The Japan Meteorological Agency issues the warnings and sends alerts to television and radio channels, the internet, and mobile phone networks. When the earthquake struck 80 miles offshore, warnings were generated in about three seconds. The tsunami warnings came three minutes later. These take longer because more complex calculations are involved and must factor in ocean data. Since the first tsunami wave struck the coastline within 20 minutes, the advanced warning provided some residents with crucial minutes to reach a safe area. While the earthquake sent powerful tsunami waves westward toward Japan, the tsunami also propagated east into the Pacific Ocean. Here, warnings are issued by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, operated by NOAA in Hawaii. NOAA maintains a large network of buoys with ocean floor sensors that are strategically positioned in the earthquake-prone zones of the Pacific. This system collects vital ocean data for tsunami forecasting. On March 11th, only 25 minutes after the earthquake struck, the first buoy station measured the tsunami and relayed information to Hawaii. Scientists used this data to run models and issue forecasts and warnings to nations throughout the Pacific. From there, local emergency managers decided what actions were appropriate to take for public safety. The earthquake and resulting tsunami devastated the Japanese coastline, causing damage that will take years to repair. While we can't prevent these forces of nature from happening, our early warning systems can help us prepare for the dangers headed our way. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Okay, a full set of coastal water forecasts tonight here for the south coast. Tomorrow, looking at north winds at about 20 knots. East northeasterly is 15 knots for the north coast. Lynn Canal, north winds 25 knots, and north winds at 20 knots for the central and southern inside waters. Then stronger winds in the forecast for Friday. Gale warnings here on the north coast. Northeast winds 40 knots, and then northeast 20 to 25 on the south coast. And uh, Gale warnings for Lynn Canal, north winds 35 knots, sea seven feet, central and southern inner channels, winds northerly at 20 to 30 knots with four to six foot seas. And for uh, Prince William Sound, northwest winds at 20 knots with three foot seas, light variable winds for northern Cook Inlet and southern Cook Inlet, northeast winds at 15 knots with three foot seas, northwesterlies at 30 knots for the Barren Islands and Kamishak Bay both northwest at 30 seas around nine feet. Uh, let's see, variable winds at 20 knots for the western North Gulf Coast and northwest at 20 for both Prince William Sound and the eastern North Gulf Coast. Outlook for Friday, Prince William Sound, north winds 30 knots, sea six feet, east northeast or north northeast actually for the North Gulf Coast at 30 knots, gale warnings, Barren Islands, north winds 35 knots, northwest at 35 for Kamishak Bay, Cook Inlet, small craft advisories for north winds 25 to 30 knots. And for Kodiak Island tomorrow, west-northwest winds 20 to 30 knots. Otherwise, for the Alaska Peninsula here, north to northeast winds at 15 knots. North winds 15 knots for Bristol Bay. And for Friday, Bristol Bay, north winds 20 knots. North to northeast winds at 20 knots for the Alaska Peninsula. Kodiak Island, gale warnings, north winds 35 knots, seas up to 11 feet. And for the eastern Aleutians on Thursday, east uh, to northeast winds, 22, maybe 25 knots, seas as high as 11 feet, small craft advisories for Adak, Gatka, and Mchitka Island, northeast winds, 25 knots, 
Kiskadeshimia, southeast winds at 20 knots. And then for Friday, swing it around to the northwest here from Shimia to Kiska at 20 knots, and north 25 from Chitka Island, northeast winds at 20 knots for Adak and Atka. And for the eastern Aleutians, east to northeast winds 15 to 20 knots. And moving up to the southwest coast, north winds tomorrow at about uh, 15 to 20 knots here, stronger south of Nunavak Island, and northeast of 20 for the Pribilofs and St. Matthew Island, light east wind of 15 knots, and pretty light winds for St. Lawrence Island under high pressure in Norton Sound, mostly north, but only at about 10 knots, no more than 10 knots. And even lighter, more variable winds in store for Friday under high pressure here over the northern Bering Sea. Variable 5 to 10 knots there, so Norton Sound, St. Lawrence Island. But for the uh, southwest coast here, north at 15 to 20 knots. St. Paul and St. George, northeast at 20 knots. And northeast at 15 for St. Matthew Island. Up along the Arctic coast, good gales tomorrow on the eastern Arctic coast at, uh, out, out of the west at 40 knots, heading east. And uh, small craft brisk wind advisories for the east central coast, 20 knots out of the west on the west side, even lighter here for the western Arctic coast and 10 to 15 for the Chuck CC. And then for Friday, from Wales to Cape Beaufort, south winds 20 to 25 knots, western Arctic coast south at 20, central coast southeast at 20. And for the eastern Beaufort Sea coast, west winds 15 to 25 knots. For tonight, snow moving eastward but hanging over the eastern interior. Could see a few inches here, central eastern interior areas. Blizzard warning for the eastern Arctic coast tonight through tomorrow. And some light snow could get all the way down to the Copper River Basin here and or even into the North Gulf Coast. Probably will see some light snow in the Copper River Basin, but that could get down to the North Gulf Coast with a few light snow showers there. Dry over the Panhandle, breezy in some areas. Light winds and fair conditions over the northern Bering Sea and the north slope and maybe a chance of some light precipitation with that weak system over the central Aleutians, but wind-wise looking really good. That continues into tomorrow as well, slowly moving uh, east-westward there, but holding over the adak atka area. High pressure clearing it out into the central interior, to interior tomorrow afternoon as snow slowly edges eastward there and maybe some snow showers for Yakutat, dry for the panhandle, and then on Friday, much windier here for the southeast coast, as we saw with the gale warnings in the north and small craft advisories to the south. And some good outflow winds, Copper River Delta, Valdez, Manuska Valley, possibly gusts of 55 miles an hour. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.